our next guest today, a regular and a favourite, all the way from Sydney, World Vegan Day 2018. Please welcome Katrina Fox. Thank you with all your love and heart. Hello everybody and welcome to World Vegan Day Melbourne. Very excited to be here. So my background is journalism, as Jason mentioned. Um, I've worked on staff and as a freelancer for a range of publications, both mainstream and niche publications in the UK, where I'm originally from, Australia and the US, uh, for about 18 years now. And I think it's fair to say that the media has had a love-hate relationship with veganism and with vegans. These are just um, some of the headlines, fairly recent headlines, and you can see the real contrast here. We've got anything from why vegan diets suck to uh, vegans being extreme, harming our cause by being militant and extreme. We've got go vegan and save the planet. And my favorite, the unstoppable rise of veganism, how a fringe movement went mainstream. So you can see what a contrast there is um, for, from the media around this. I want to take you back 10 years. So in 2011, a study was done called Vegophobia. It was done by some researchers in the UK. And what they did was they studied the, some UK newspapers in 2007. So throughout 2007, they looked at coverage of veganism, plant-based living, and, and vegans in general. And this is what they found. Now, it was a qualitative study rather than a quantitative study, so there weren't a huge amount of numbers. But what they found out of 397 articles in UK newspapers in 2007, only 22 of those, a piddly little 5,500, were positive. Only 20, uh, 80 of them, or 20.2, were neutral. And a whopping 295 articles, that's 74.3%, were negative. So that just gives a little bit of context between then and now. So if we fast forward to today, we're starting to see, obviously the media landscape has changed quite a lot now because we've got a lot more online, for example. So we're seeing a lot more coverage of veganism. The media are literally falling over themselves to cover some aspect of veganism and plant-based living. So, for example, it could be something like the top headline here, which is um, about the first vegan beer hall in a local area. So, for those of you who are here today who are business owners or you own a brand, this is a really nice way to get yourself some free publicity, some editorial media coverage. If you're the first in your area, if you're the first in your city, your state, your country or the world, it's a really, it, chances are you'll, you'll get some kind of media coverage because the media love to cover something new, something different. They really like firsts. Um, there's also something called newsjacking. So what happens now is there'll be a news story around something related to veganism, but then that's not the end of it. What happens is when we can influence this as vegan activists is you keep the conversation going. So media outlets are always looking for spin-off stories. So this second one um, here is a good example of that. Recently, there's a big contest in the UK called The Great British Bake Off. It's a massively popular TV show in the UK. And recently, for the first time ever, they decided to have a vegan week. So the contestants only use vegan products to make their cakes. So that was the news story. Now, the Daily Mirror, which is a tabloid newspaper in the UK, has gone with the angle, what is a vegan? Here's some food you can and can't eat during Bake Off week. So see how they've taken the, the basic news story of it Bake Off having a vegan week, and then they've created a spin-off story. Now, there's actually been some negative um, articles uh, that have come around because some people have said, oh, vegan week during Bake Off week, I'd rather die than eat vegan cakes. Um, so, you know, that's obviously attracted a little bit of negative coverage. But again, that offers possibilities for us as vegan activists to come forward and showcase images um, of amazingly delicious vegan cakes and cupcakes and chocolates. So it keeps the conversation going. So have a think about something called newsjacking. So when there's a news story and you can find some kind of spin-off around it, that's a way for us to pitch to the media and get our message out in a positive way. 
And then something like Fashion Journal. So this is more of a niche media outlet. So they've covered a story called an affordable vegan hairdressing brand just arrived in Australia. So Fashion Journal is not going to write about food. So it's really important when you're pitching the media to make sure you pitch the relevant stories to the relevant media outlet for their specific audience. Okay? And then you've got the really light and fluffy stuff, as you can see from the bottom headline, that Townsville is now home to Australia's hottest vegan. Who knew? So as you can see from these examples, there really is, there's a lot of scope for coverage around the vegan lifestyle. And we really need to be proactive in, in getting stories out there, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Now, a lot of media coverage, unsurprisingly, is around food. We all have to eat food. If we don't eat, we will die. Um, so there's going to be, there's a lot of things happening. The top one you'll see, this is something called a listicle. It's called a listicle because it lists things. So in this instance, it's the best um, top vegan um, eateries in the Gold Coast. And this is from the Gold Coast Bulletin. This is particularly popular with online journalism lately. So the media really like these kind of lists. Again, if you are a vegan business owner or you own a brand, you want to be included in this kind of list because, again, it's free publicity. And you can leverage that PR, that coverage, because if any one of those that are, covered, that are included in that list, they can now go to their website and their marketing collateral and say, hey, the Gold Coast, as featured in the Gold Coast Bulletin, or, uh, you know, among the top, voted among the top 13 best vegan eateries in the Gold Coast by the Gold Coast Bulletin. So it's not only you're getting the media coverage, you can also leverage off that as well. Another type of media coverage around food is what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of large mainstream food companies, for example, that are not vegan, but are bringing out vegan products. So they're kind of jumping on the vegan bandwagon. One of the most recent was around Hungry Jack's. So again, the main story around Hungry Jack's was that they've launched a vegan burger. But then, remember I just talked to you about newsjacking, so there have also been some stories around some journalists have tried the vegan burger at Hungry Jack's and they didn't like it. So that, you know, what we're seeing is, again, it's keeping that conversation going um, around the one story. So we're going to see more and more of this kind of coverage as more mainstream companies, uh, businesses in particular, um, get with the vegan program or the plant-based program. We are also starting to see a lot more coverage around vegan beauty, which is quite heartening. Again, the top one here from the Daily Beast, this is another listicle. They, they don't always have to have numbers in them, so as you can see with this one, vegan beauty products actually worth buying. Now, I want to take a moment here and get you to really look at these headlines. So I have a Google alert set up for the word vegan and the word vegan business. When you're looking at these headlines, when you're pitching to the media, Use these kind of working headlines. Is that mine? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> when you are pitching to the media, you, for your subject header in your email, use the, figure out a, a working headline that's similar to the style that the media outlet uses. Because journalists' inboxes are chock-a-block. And if you just put a subject header, press release, a uh, new vegan beauty product, chances are it, there's not enough detail, they're just going to hit the delete button. So, but when you're, you're using headlines or subject headers that are similar to the headlines that they use, it's likely to grab their attention, okay? And again, we've got another listicle here, which is the best plant-based vegan-friendly products in Australia. So listicles are, are very popular. We're starting now to see a lot more coverage around fashion, around vegan fashion. There's some amazing developments happening in vegan fashion with biofabrication, leather made from mushrooms and pineapples. Uh, re really exciting stuff happening. So I anticipate we're going to see um, more of that as well. Again, we can see here Vogue has done another listicle. And this is 23 vegan bag shoes and jackets for your fall wish list. Now, notice how that's even niched down even more. So this isn't just 23 vegan jackets, etc., for your wardrobe, but this is for your fall wardrobe. So this is US Vogue, so fall is autumn, for those of you who don't know. So this is something that you, again, you can pitch throughout the season. So it might be a range of products for Christmas, for example, or for winter, for summer, for spring. So this is hopefully trying to give you some good ideas about how you can come up with ideas to pitch to the media so that we as vegan activists are helping and doing our best to control the narrative rather than having it controlled for us. 
again with Fashion Journal, so they covered a, a particular brand. So nowadays, journalists are looking for interesting brand stories, and that often will involve around the founder. I was actually on the phone last week with a journalist from The Age, um, brainstorming with her. She wanted to do a story on World Vegan Day, and we were literally brainstorming loads and loads of ideas, and it was interesting kind of working with her to see, you know, what her criteria was. And, you know, it's no longer just, you're no longer the only vegan cheese in town anymore. So you've got to have these extra stories, and sometimes that will be about your personal journey as the founder, for example. So we can see here with, with Fashion Journal, they did this brand makes cruelty-free heels, not just shoes, cruelty-free heels for the vegan businesswoman. See how kind of micro-niched that is, and that's what we're starting to see happening more now. Um, we're starting to see less kind of generic coverage around veganism and more kind of targeted aspects of the vegan lifestyle. Again, that's useful for you to know so that you can also be pitching to the media, because the media are always looking for stories. And if you can pitch the right story to the right journalist at the right time, you stand a decent chance of getting coverage. It's all about what you can do for them. It's not what they can do for you. Never approach a journalist and say, hey, I'd like some publicity for my vegan brand. It's a big no-no. Even to vegan journalists such as myself, even I get annoyed when I get pitches like that. Um, it's about what you can do for the journalist. How can you help them write engaging, shareable stories so that it's a win for everyone? Celebrities, of course. The media loves celebrities. Whatever we think about that, rightly or wrongly, we live in a celebrity-obsessed culture. So the more we can get uh, vegan, high-profile vegans and celebrities on our side, the better. Miley Cyrus has been really great. She seems to be a genuine, passionate, ethical vegan. Um, I happen to know that she took all her favorite vegan shoes and boots and took them to a vegan designer, shoe designer, and said, make me vegan versions of these. She turned up at an event um, with Stella McCartney and basically told the media that high fashion needs to go vegan. So she seems like a, a pretty cool chick. I like Miley. This one here with Virat, so Virat's a cricket player and he went vegan and he feels fabulous both physically and mentally. So the New Statesman have covered that as a straightforward news piece. Now see what the Times of India have done with the news jacking. They've taken the basic story that, hey, Virat's gone vegan, but then they've added something, should you too? So that article is then discussing the, the pros and the cons of eating vegan. Is eating vegan healthy for you? Do you see how it's keeping the conversation going? It's it's not just one uh, news hit about one aspect of veganism. We really have opportunities to keep the conversation going in different types of media. Business and trade media. We're seeing way more media coverage in the business and trade media. So for the past 12 months up until recently, I had a Forbes column um, writing about vegan and plant-based business. So I've written about 26 stories. They've had over half a million views between them on all aspects of vegan and plant-based business sector. We're even seeing highly conservative outlets like the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal is probably the most conservative financial and business publication in the US. Even they're covering some aspects of vegan business. This particular story they're covering about a vegan dog food company that's raised $4 million. Now, Again, important to make sure that you pitch the right stories to the right outlet. So the Wall Street Journal is not going to cover a home-based business making cookies in their kitchen. But if that home-based business, two, three years down the track, so expands and has attracted three or four million dollars in investment, then the Wall Street Journal may well cover it. So it's, again, it's all about pitching that right story. Um, also trade media, so Costco, there's a lot more Costco stores in the US, there's several hundred, and it's a membership type based store where you pay an annual fee and then you go into the stores and you buy products at wholesale prices, so they're much cheaper. We've got a handful of Costco stores here in Australia, and Costco recently took on board their first plant-based meat products, and they were uh, traditional burgers by the Fry Family Food Company. Some of you may know Fry's, they're a lovely ethical vegan brand based now here in Australia. And so the trade media, uh, food and drink business, covered that. So we're starting to see a lot more coverage by uh, vegan, vegan outlets. Um, this is a blog post that I wrote uh, because they're on, on my vegan business media website about vegan investors. There are a lot more vegan and vegan friendly investors nowadays. Even if they're not personally vegan, investors are falling over themselves to invest in vegan and plant-based brands because they're seeing 
that um, you know the the growth in these sectors are, are skyrocketing. So there's a list of those on the website, um, and it's I add to it when I hear about new people. But even this can also attract media coverage. This is CNBC. CNBC is another. It's a big, huge TV channel, business channel. Goes into millions of homes in the U.S. And as you can see, they ran a story called "Meet the Vegan Mafia," the, a secret group of investors uh, betting on the future of food. Um, so even stories about investors uh, are coming up as well. We can also see here TechCrunch. They reported on the fact that a uh, a meal delivery service, vegan meal delivery service, all plants in the U.K. They raised seven and a half million in funding. That's about 13 million Australian dollars. Just to put that into context, I think at the mo it may st it was at the time it may still be the largest um, plant-based startup, the largest amount that a, a plant-based startup in Europe has attracted. So the business and trade media are really getting interested in this. The environment. We're starting to see a little bit more of a resurgence now in the links between veganism and the environment. We had a bit of coverage back in 2006 when the United Nations brought out its um, report, Livestock's Long Shadow, making the connections between animal agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions. In earlier this year, Oxford University researchers uh, did some research and found, as the Independent reported, that veganism is the single biggest way to reduce our environmental impact. It's in quotes there because they're quoting the researchers. Uh, Beyond Meat, some of you will have heard of the American brand Beyond Meat, which is, uh, um, along with Impossible Burger, they're plant-based meat brands that bleed. And um, the Beyond, Me Beyond Meat, who produced the Beyond Burger, commissioned a university in the US to do a life cycle study from, of the production of its products compared to the production of a traditional beef burger. And they found, the university found, it was a peer-reviewed study, found that the vegan, the plant-based burgers were by far more environmentally friendly and had far less impact than traditional beef burgers. So again, this is something that's being covered in the media. It's something that we as activists can continue to pitch and to remind the media to keep that conversation going. Now, unsurprisingly, we're starting to see a backlash, particularly from the animal agriculture industry. So, and this backlash can come in all kinds of bizarre forms. So some of you might have heard recently, a TV writer uh, created a recipe for vegan barbecue brisket using jackfruit and seitan. And loads of people got really angry and said, you can't call that uh, brisket vegan. It, your brisket must have animal products in it. And News Limited, in their wisdom, saw fit to, you know, thought this was newsworthy and wrote a story about it. We've also seen as well uh, things like, you know, again, these stereotypes of vegans as violent, as militant, as extreme. Now, I'm not going to tell anyone how to do their activism. I wouldn't do that. I've done all types of activism from not, since 1987. I've been chased by riot police through fields back in the UK. I've stood outside vivisection labs screaming at scientists. Um, what I would say to you though is just be aware that when you are doing your vegan activism and, and various types of it, this can happen. These headlines can, you know, will happen and come up. So just be aware of that because the media loves conflict. It loves conflict and controversy. So in these latter two stories, you've got the poor, terrified farmers over here, and you've got the angry, violent, militant vegans here. We all know that, uh, you know, the, what the animal agriculture is an incredibly violent industry, but that's not what's being played out in the media with certain types of activism. So just be aware of that. Again, I'm not telling anyone what to do and what not to do. We do what, what, what we feel is right, but just be aware of this, this, these are the kinds of headlines that can result. Animal Ag is also um, continuing to sponsor and fund research. So earlier this year, you might have seen headlines proclaiming that if children don't drink cow's milk and only drink plant-based milk, their growth will be stunted. Um, but then it was found when someone did a little bit of digging, one of the vegan media outlets did a bit of digging, that research was surprisingly linked to a company connected with the dairy industry. So, you know, they've got billions of dollars to play with. They, they have no qualms about, uh, you know, bringing out this kind of thing. And again, media love these kinds of things because their studies, their research 
they'll report on them. So it's really important for us as activists to respond to this, to have vegan health professionals who can comment on and counteract this kind of propaganda uh, and point out these links around the funding. Recently as well, the, uh, the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail ran a story. Basically, it was one dietitian, an expert dietitian. Oh, it's a fly attacking me, and I'm vegan. I'm not going to hurt you. Um, <laughs> the, um, they, this expert dietitian basically said that vegan diets uh, are causing uh, eating disorders because it's such a restrictive diet. Now, look, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in some cases. You know, people with eating disorders may well use plant-based diet to cover that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the way this is reported, it kind of implied that just anyone that eats a vegan diet is, has got some kind of eating disorder. Um, and, and again, we need vegan health professionals, vegan doctors, vegan nutritionists to be able to counteract that so that we change the narrative, so that that's not just the, the, the information of record, okay? This is really, I think this really shows how threatened animal agriculture feels. They're making moves now to ban the use of words like milk or meat on products that don't come from animals. So the FDA in America, they haven't done it yet, but they're making moves to ban the use of terms like milk and butter for products that don't have dairy in them. And France has already banned the use of the word meat on things like plant-based burgers and sausages. Same thing in Missouri, the state of Missouri in the US. That was literally just last month. This is how threatened they're feeling. So are we winning or losing the, the media battle? In my view, look, I think we are. We're doing a lot better. We're absolutely doing a lot better. We've got a lot more tools at our disposal. We've got social media. We can become the media. We can help to create stories and give the media stories and, and put that out there. So I do think we're doing, we've got more control. Um, we've got more opportunities to spread the message of veganism in a positive way than we've had before. But it is an ongoing battle. And as I said earlier, we need to be proactive as activists. I work a lot, my, nowadays I work predominantly with vegan business owners and entrepreneurs uh, about helping them to raise their brand, um, in, uh, raise the profile of their brand, particularly in the media, and also with activists. And I hear a lot of people say that either they're scared of the media, they're a bit too nervous, or they're really cynical. They're like, oh, I hate journalists, I hate the media, it's awful, and they don't want to get involved. But seriously, I'm going to say to you today, you really need to get over your fear of the media and also change your attitude towards the media. Become their friend. Become, because they want stories, as, as I mentioned. They, they haven't, I mean, some of them may have an agenda, sure. Some of them may be anti-vegan, but not all of them. Generally, they just want good stories that they can pitch to their editors. It will run, it will get lots of clicks and shares. Advertisers are happy, their bosses are happy, the audience has got an interesting story. So if we can put our positive aspects of me veganism out there, it's a win for everyone, okay? So I really want to encourage you to do that. If we don't, the other side will. As we've seen already from some of these headlines, they will. They will spend their advertising and their PR dollars to get their messages out there. So we really need to be proactive. We're on a, a roll at the moment. Veganism's having a moment. It's had a very long moment, literally since for about four years now, since 2014. Uh, as I say, the media are literally falling them over themselves to, to write stories about various aspects of veganism. So we need to keep that momentum going. If we don't, if we pull back, the other side will start flooding with their propaganda and that's not gonna help anybody. And just finally, so yes, just a little plug. Um, this is something I do help people with. I work with vegan business owners, entrepreneurs, authors, and creatives. Uh, I teach them how to do their own PR if they can't afford to hire a publicist, how to get into the media. I do that through my Vegans in the Limelight online PR course and group coaching program, and also one-on-one -on -one consults. And for those of you who do uh, animal rights and vegan activism in a different way, I've got a three-hour um, recording of a live webinar training I did earlier this year, specifically around media training for vegan and animal rights activists. You can find all of that and some free tips on, in blog posts and, and podcasts on veganbusinessmedia.com.